Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So do check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're investigating the extension of the Nelson Siegel yield curve model, which is the extension proposed by Svensson in 1994, and which has become the go-to technique of modeling yield curves because of its flexibility, and it's commonly referred to as the Nelson Siegel Svensson yield curve or the NSS model. And what it does in comparison to the Nelson Siegel model is that it adds another source of uh, curvature to the yield curve to model multiple humps across the curve, across different tenors, across different maturities. Recapping the Nelson Siegel, uh, which was proposed by Nelson Siegel in 1987, and which we have investigated in one of our previous videos, it has the long-term level of um, interest rates, the long-term value to which interest rates tend to at very high maturities, think maybe 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, theoretical values for those, so that would be B0, then you would have the uh, slope, which would uh, tell you whether the yield curve is upward sloping or downward sloping, so you can model normal, flat, and inverted yield curves. So if um, B1 is zero, you would have a flat yield curve. If it's positive, you would have an inverted yield curve. If it's negative, you would have a normal, so upward sloping yield curve. So this is quite simple. And then you've got the uh, B2 parameter, which corresponds to the curvature or to the shapes of the yield curve in terms of its humps. So you can model humped or even U-shaped yield curves using this parameter. And what is key here is the decay parameter lambda, which tells you where humps occur. So what is the maturity at which the interest rate reaches its maximum, its minimum for humps and U-shapes uh, respectively, as well as how fast uh, does the yield curve creep up or go down to its long-term value of B0. Svensson simply proposed another term with B3 as the coefficient and mu as the decay parameter to capture the humps more flexibly. The first thing that Svensson's specification allows is you can have two humps that are modeled by B2 and lambda and B3 and mu, but also given that you have got uh, lambda and mu as your decay parameters and they can be very different, you can have a hump at very um, short maturities, at very short-term tenors, and a hump at more long-term maturities and long-term tenors. So it's even more common for the nelson siegel svensson model to have got lambda and mu parameters fixed around maturities where you expect those sorts of humps can um, form and allow all other four parameters, beta naught, beta one, beta two, and beta three, to vary. So let's start with zeros across the board for beta naught, beta one, beta two, and beta three. Put one for lambda and 10 for mu. Again, if you have got lambda and mu being the same thing, this model would not be uh, benefiting from the Svensson extension. It would be uh, quite, quite a bit equivalent to the uh, Nelson and Siegel 1987 specification, so please do allow those model those parameters to be different. And now let's just apply the equation for the spot rates. Uh, bear in mind, this is the spot rate equation, and that's why it looks a little bit bulky. Nelson, Siegel, and Svensson all initially constructed this model for forward rates, which are instantaneous uh, rates, and spot rates, which we observe in real-world markets when we calculate yields, are um, actually the integrations of those for, of those forward rates, instantaneous rates, over time, and that's why these sorts of expressions look quite bulky, and that they can resemble quite a lot what you find when integrating exponential distribution functions. And this is the direct mathematical analogy between Nelson Siegel Swenson um, way of modeling yield curves and exponential distributions. However, we can uh, apply this function easily enough. Uh, in Excel using our parameters and uh, our maturities. So B0, the long-term value, plus B1 times the um, exponential decay parameter. So we input 
uh, 1 minus the exponent of negative lambda times the tenor or the maturity here. And then we divide it by lambda times the tenor or the maturity. Make sure that, uh, well, all of the uh, parameters such as betas, lambda, mu are locked and the maturity parameter is not locked because you want it to vary across the curve. Then we can add our beta 2 parameter, which here corresponds to longer term curvatures, as it decays uh, quite a bit slower than mu, which would decay at 10 times faster, times uh, our exponential decay parameter again. So we open the parentheses, 1 minus the exponent of negative lambda times time. Then we divide it by lambda times time again and then we subtract exponent of negative lambda times time then we close the parentheses for the beta 2 um, decay parameter and add our extension for the Slanton model so we add our locked beta 3 we add Again, the exponential decay, but here instead of lambda, we are using mu. So we times it by t. We divide it by mu times t. And then we subtract the exponent of negative mu times t, or the tenor, or the maturity. And as we close the appropriate number of parentheses, we can apply this model throughout. And obviously, it's unsurprising, this particular model will give us a flat yield curve at 0% throughout. If we raise the uh, beta naught parameter to be 5%, we'll have a flat yield curve at 5% throughout. If we change our slope parameter to be, well, 0.01, for example, we'll have a downward slope and yield curve. If we have it negative, we'll have an upward slope and yield curve. If we add a positive B2 shape parameter, for example, 0.01 here, We'll have a hump at around um, two years maturity. If we add this parameter uh, for beta 3, we'll have a hump at around one year maturity. That corresponds to the fact that lambda is equal to 1 and mu is equal to 10. So, for example, if uh, we were returned to the uh, beta 2 uh, shape parameter and change lambda to be something like 0 0.1, we'll have a much more long term hump in around, well, 15, 16 years of maturity. That corresponds to the fact that lambda and mu uh, do um, reflect um, various timings of those humps occurring. So if we would like to optimize our model this way, uh, we would need to first fix lambda and mu. So for example, if we believe that there will be a hump at around five years, we can take mu to be equal to, well, uh, 0 0.2 and if we believe that another hump would be in around maybe 50 years we can put lambda at 0 0.02 and uh, then uh, allow our parameters to vary so that that fits the data the best uh, and now we can uh, describe what data we can use to actually fit the nelson siegel svensson curve uh, the best so here we've got uh, 10 uk government bond coupons and prices obtained from MarketWatch. That's the best uh, free source, uh, I believe, to use for these sorts of exercises. Again, the nelson siegel Svensson curve, just as the nelson siegel can be applied not only to sovereign yields, but also to corporate yields, to interbank offer rates, to any sort of interest rate that exists across maturities to plot a yield curve and study the uh, nature of um, your interest rate through time. So here, what we can do is we can calculate the uh, values of those um, bonds given their coupons and their maturities and minimize the deviation from real-world prices. So for the uh, one-year bond, uh, we need to, first of all, uh, incorporate the uh, principal repayment. And obviously, all government bonds in the UK and many bonds around the world all have a standard um, principle of 100, so that makes life easier. So we've got 100 divided by 1 plus the one-year yield to the power of 1. Again, we can do that because those yields are spot 
yield and not uh, forward yields. If those would be forward yields, we'll need to uh, integrate them a little bit uh, in a little bit more challenging way. But as those are spot rates, we can do it that simply. And then we need to take into account the coupons. So we sum all the coupons, the discounted values of those that will be um, paid throughout the lifetime of the bond of the respective maturity. So we refer to the coupon, then we divide it by one plus the yield, and the yield would change depending on when the coupon is paid. So we refer to the first yield and lock it. Then we refer to the B7 cell once again, because we'll allow it to change and become an array of yields as time goes on. And then we raise it to the power of the maturity. So again, we refer to the very first maturity, one year, lock it, and then refer to the same cell again without locking it. So we allow it to be uh, changed and extend the range of maturities we refer to as the maturity of the bond increases. And that allows us to calculate very flexibly the market values of all of our 10 bonds across all of our 10 maturities. And for example, for a seven year bond, we'll refer to the seven year yield, we'll refer to yields all along the way for the coupons and the maturities all the way to seven for our seven coupons that are due. Again, this um, assumes that coupons are annually paid, which is not often the case, but this is um, close enough to what happens in reality to use it in modeling yield curves. But obviously you could model uh, your yields for quarters or for half annual periods and then just divide your coupons by four or by two, and this procedure will work just as well. So now for the mispricing, we can sum squared the differences between the actual prices and the values from our model curve. And we want to minimize this mispricing by valuing the parameters of the nelson siegel svensson yield curve. So we go data solver and specify our task. We want the mispricing to be minimized by changing those four parameters. Remember, we have our lambda and mu decay parameters locked to reflect our own assumptions about when humps occur. We untick this box because we might want our curve to be, well, upward sloping, or we might want our humps to be either humps or U-shaped um, curves. So we untick that and we click solve to retrieve our curve. And we see that our curve is upward sloping. Uh, our Both of our shape parameters are positive, which refers to humps and not U-shapes. And we have got quite um, a realistic um, line that is projected from very short-term yields that are quite low to long-term yields that are high. And we can see that uh, at the very long term, we would have our rates go back to, well, around 5% exactly. Because if we change that to something like a million, so like a very um, hypothetical yield, we'll get 5.03% exactly this long-term level. But if we say 100, at this point, the first hump parameter would dominate, and this particular hump, given by this slow decay, this would give us quite a high yield at this particular point in time. So we can experiment with those lambdas and mu's to give us um, the best fitting yield curve. So for example, if we have got a slightly higher values of these parameters, so slightly faster humps occurring, and we solve once again, we'll have um, another type of a curve with a with a inverted hump occurring quite um, close to the current time, two years in the future, around. And then we would have a large hump uh, again, a positive one, this is the maximum, occurring around 12 to 13 years in the future. But again, bear in mind we used 10 years of yields or bond prices to estimate this curve for 30 years. So this particular tail, this particular decline might be due to overfitting. And that's one of the major concerns that Nelson Siegel Swenson model has, and it introduced two extra parameters, the risk of overfitting to the data is higher. So always keep that in mind when trying to extrapolate from the results of the Nelson Siegel Svensson curve to maturities that you have not covered. And that's all there is for the application of the Nelson Siegel Svensson yield curve model in Excel. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business finance or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel or consider support us on Patreon. Thank you very much and stay tuned.